Hey guys, JJ here. In this lesson, I'll be talking to you guys about the insulin signaling cascade. Now, before I get into the signaling pathway itself, I just want to talk to you guys briefly about how, uh, how and where insulin is actually coming from. So, after you have a meal, uh, your blood glucose levels will increase. Now, uh, what will happen is your, the pancreas, which is an organ just uh, located adjacent to the duodenum, which is a, the first part of your small intestine, uh, the pancreas will actually detect the increase in blood glucose levels. Now, there are these islands or groups of cells in the pancreas called the islets of Langerhans. Now, now the islets of Langerhans are groups of cells, uh, which include alpha cells that are located along the periphery of the island, and you have uh, beta cells, which are located more near the center of the islet. Now, what will happen is the beta cells will detect the increase in blood glucose and will release insulin to the bloodstream. Now here is a typical cell, uh, with a, here's your plasma membrane, and here is a uh, insulin receptor. Now an insulin uh, receptor is just a heterotetrameric uh, structure, and what I mean by that is um, it's composed of four subunits, two extracellular alpha subunits, and two transmembrane beta subunits. Now what will happen is the insulin will bind to the extracellular alpha subunits. Now the beta subunits themselves have kinase activity and what I mean by that is once insulin binds to the alpha subunits, the beta subunits become activated and autophosphorylate themselves on tyrosine residues. So once the beta subunits become phosphorylated, they become activated and what will happen is the, the beta subunits will actually lead to the phosphorylation and activation of insulin receptor substrate or IRS. Um, there's different isoforms of this uh, of this protein, but uh, IRS one and two are, are some of the main the main isoforms. Now, phosphorylation and activation of IRS isoforms is regulated by a protein known as P10 or phosphatase and tensin homologue deleted from chromosome 10. Now, that's a quite a large name that really is not important, but just remember, guys, that P10 can actually uh, regulate. Uh, the phosphorylation and activation of IRS isoforms by actually dephosphorylating IRS which, because P10 is actually a uh, protein tyrosine phosphatase. It'll actually dephosphorylate IRS. Now when IRS is phosphorylated and activated, you'll get other proteins um, including PI3K or phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase which will actually bind to IRS through its P85 uh, subunit. Now, uh, P PI3K will actually bind to IRS um, through an SH2 domain, but that's not really important for now. So once that happens, guys, uh, once PI3K binds to IRS, what will happen is PI3K will actually phosphorylate PIP2 or uh, Phosphatidyl inositol 4 5 bisphosphate to PIP3, which is phosphatidyl inositol uh, 3 4 5 triphosphate. Interestingly enough, uh, P10 is also a negative regulator of PIP3. It actually dephosphorylates PIP3 as well, so uh, P10 is also a negative regulator of PIP3. Nevertheless, um, when PI3K phosphorates enough PIP2 to PIP3, PIP3 concentrations increase, um, which actually recruit other proteins toward the uh, the plasma membrane, including PDK1 and AKT. Uh, AKT is also known as protein kinase B. So what will happen is increased concentrations of PIP3 will actually recruit PDK1 and AKT toward the plasma membrane. Um, and will actually activate PDK1. So PDK1 will actually become activated and then will actually phosphorylate AKT. Now insulin sensitive cells typically have reservoirs um, of uh, vessel vesicles, intracellular vesicles that contain glucose uh, transporters um, embedded in the vesicle itself. So uh, the, the cell has the, the, the glucose transporters in in uh, embedded in, in vesicles in the cell, but they're just not, the, the, the glucose transporter or GLUT4, this is an insulin 
sensitive or insulin dependent glucose transporter, GLUT4. It has GLUT4 inside the cell, but but it's really useless because you need GLUT4 to be embedded in the, the actual plasma membrane so that you can bring glucose into the cell. So what what typically happens is you, you need translocation to occur. You need uh, you need your GLUT4 vesicles to translocate to the plasma membrane and um, embed those GLUT4 transporters in the membrane. However, there's a protein known as AS160 that actually inhibits this process. So in, in a cell that's not stimulated by insulin, you continuously have AS160 inhibiting um, glucose for uh, vesicular translocation to the membrane. So you always have this process inhibited. However, once when you have insulin stimulation and you get to this point here where AKT is uh, phosphorylated and activated by PDK1, AKT will actually phosphorylate and inactivate AS160. So um, AKT will actually phosphorylate and inactivate AS160, which will then actually allow the translocation to occur, and then you'll get the uh, GLUT4 or glucose transporter 4 embedded into the, the uh, cellular membrane. Once you have GLUT4 in the, in, embedded in the membrane, you can allow glucose. Uh, glucose can be transported inside of the cell, which means that glucose can undergo uh, glycolysis. Now, AKT's inhibiting phosphorylation of AS160 is not the only thing that occurs within the cell. In actuality, AKT also phosphorylates a, a few other proteins. One of them is uh, GSK3 or glycogen synthase kinase 3 and it'll actually inhibit GSK3. Now GSK3 typically is, is, a, is a kinase which phosphorylates and inactivates uh, GS or glycogen synthase which is uh, a very important enzyme involved in glycogen synthesis. So if you can think about it guys, um, if you have AKT um, inhibiting GSK3 which is a natural, or a natural inhibitor of uh, glycogen synthase you're inhibiting an inhibitor, so that means GS is actually activated. So you're actually activating glycogen, synth uh, glycogen synthesis as well. So AKT is not only allowing glucose to enter the cell and undergo glycolysis, but it's also activating glycogen synthesis so that you can store that glucose that's brought into the cell. Now another very important thing that AKT does is it actually activates mTOR complex 1 or mammalian target of rapamycin complex 1. Now AKT doesn't phosphorylate mTOR C1 directly, it actually acts through a couple of steps including uh, uh, tuberous sclerosis complex and REB proteins. Now once uh, mTOR uh, C1 is activated, it'll actually activate its downstream target P70S6 kinase through phosphorylation. Now P70S6 kinase will actually activate several downstream targets which aren't really important in this, in this scheme. Um, however, what is important is that P70S6K will actually negatively um, inhibit IRS protein um, by phosphorylating IRS um, on serine residues. So P70S6K um, phosphorylation of IRS on serine residues represents a negative feedback inhibition um, of, of P70S6K on insulin signaling. And that's just another way that insulin signaling is controlled by negative feedback inhibition. So what happens when insulin is dislodged from the insulin receptor? Well, GLUT4 is, uh, GLUT4 localization to the, uh, the plasma membrane is entirely dependent on the presence of insulin um, and activation of the insulin receptor. So once insulin is dislodged and it, it's, it's uh, and insulin receptor is no longer no longer stimulated by insulin, GLUT4 will actually be taken back up into uh, GLUT4 containing vesicles um, for for the next time the cell is stimulated by insulin. So it pretty much once once insulin leaves, um, glucose will no longer be transported in the cell because GLUT4 will be stored again as as GLUT, um, GLUT4 containing vesicles inside the cell. Now there are, there are other proteins involved in this pathway that I didn't mention, but these are the main ones um, that you guys should know to have a good understanding of the insulin signaling cascade. 
Anyways, guys, that was the Insulin Signaling Cascade. If you found this video helpful, please like this video. It's greatly appreciated. And please subscribe to my channel for more lessons like this one. Thanks, guys.